Welcome everybody back to this afternoon or uh, evening session. This topic will be pseudo randomness and uh, lower bounds. I would like to ask all the speakers to make sure to stay within their uh, allotted eight minutes. Um, and also I would like to um, ask the audience if they have a quick question to ask it at the end of the talk. If they have a question, they probably is going to have a longer answer. Maybe hold it until the end of the session where we are going to have time for a longer discussion. So we start uh, the session with a talk on uh, some square lower bounds using high dimensional expanders and uh, Madur is going to give the talk, please. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? Hi. Um, Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone to the virtual talk and uh, I'll be talking about uh, some connections between uh, uh, sum of squares hierarchy and certain pseudo random objects called high dimensional expanders. Uh, this is joint work with Irid Dinur, uh, Yuval Filmus um, and uh, Pralad Harsh. So high dimensional expanders are uh, just notions of uh, expanding hypergraphs. There are actually quite a few different definitions of uh, what it means to be an expander hypergraph motivated by combinatorial, spectral, and topological considerations. Uh, we won't go into the precise definitions during the talk, except I should say that uh, there are explicit constructions uh, given by Lubotsky, Samuels, and Vishne of objects which satisfy uh, many of these definitions. And then these are the ones that we will use uh, uh, here and although this is a new area, high dimensional expanders have already found a huge number of applications uh, to uh, many different uh, uh, kind of, uh, areas in theoretical computer science. And today I'm in particular going to talk about their application to constructing hard instances for certain optimization problems. Uh, the specific optimization problem I'll be interested in is uh, 3XOR, which is um, just uh, system of linear equations um, over F2. So suppose you are given a system of M linear equations in N variables, each equation having three variables over F2. And the goal is to find an assignment to the variables satisfying as many constraints as possible. Uh, and we can also think of it as uh, being an instance being specified by uh, a collection of three tuples uh, script T, which form the left-hand side of all the equations. And uh, a function beta from this collection script, script T to F2 or 0, 1, which forms the right-hand side of all these equations. So uh, the instance is specified by a collection of left-hand sides and a connection of left right-hand sides. Uh, the optimization algorithm we will consider for this is uh, something called the sum of squares hierarchy, which is actually a family of algorithms. It's, uh, uh, it gives semi-definite programming relaxations for uh, combinatorial and even continuous optimization problems uh, can be thought of as a computational model in particular for constraint satisfaction problems. If you think of the hierarchy comes in levels and if you think of the tth level, it can be solved in time and to the order t. The specific relaxation will not be as relevant during the talk, but uh, uh, just uh, in case you want to see, this is the relaxation for three XOR given by the sum of squares hierarchy. The thing I would like to note is uh, it's parameterized by this uh, parameter t, and then there is a, a, a unit vector for uh, every subset of the variables of size at most t, and then this is what defines the hierarchies. And you can think of it as kind of a, an algorithm which does all kinds of local reasoning up to a locality of size t, but it also does uh, spectral things. Mm -hmm. And one aspect that I want to focus on is that uh, the many known kind of lower bounds uh, for this family of algorithms or this computation model, also many upper bounds, but the lower bounds in particular rely on uh, random instances in one way or another. I mean, either you have a random instance or you start from random instance, do some reduction on top of it, et cetera. And our goal is to construct explicit instances. And in particular, the result I want to uh, compare against is this uh, it's known that uh, if you look at a random 3XOR formula, choose the left-hand sides and right-hand sides both at random, sufficient number of constraints, then the instance is not satisfiable. And in fact, it's far from satisfiable. No assignment satisfies more than 51% of the constraints. On the other hand, the SOS hierarchy 
thinks it's completely satisfiable and fails to even refute it, which means just prove that you know, sort of uh, uh, there can be an assignment which can satisfy all constraints as far as the SOS hierarchy is concerned. And in our work, we uh, kind of give uh, an instance which is constructible in deterministic polynomial time, but is weaker in certain senses. So first, uh, these instances, if you think of this number mu as say 0.1, then what we essentially say is that there are instances which no assignment satisfies more than 90% of the constraints. And SOS still fails to refute it. So the SOS hierarchy still thinks that the instance is completely satisfiable. But for known random instances, this can be proved even for a linear number of levels or omega n levels of SOS hierarchy. Here we can only prove it for square root log n levels. Mm, a couple of comments about the result. So uh, to some extent, this issue of one minus mu or 90% versus 51% can be sort of uh, uh, handled uh, in particular combining with known reductions uh, and uh, inside the SOS hierarchy, one can show that um, there are explicit instances in which the soundness is half plus epsilon. So no assignment satisfies more than half plus epsilon fraction. SOS thinks uh, almost all constraints are satisfiable or one minus delta, though not quite one. And you can also obtain gaps or explicit instances for many other problems using reductions. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first explicit integrality gap construction. I should say that if you are just interested in distinction between satisfiable and unsatisfiable, there are things called Scythian tautologies, which are essentially systems of XOR equations, which is an unsatisfiable system. SOS thinks it's satisfiable. The construction is explicit, but there is no gap. It's, it's kind of almost satisfiable. If you just kind of delete one equation, the system becomes satisfiable and don't quite have a gap between soundness and completeness. Another interesting thing is, I mean, the instances are not just explicit. They have a nice structure in particular they're based on these high dimensional expanders. And in this sense, they offer maybe a subtle contrast or even a con maybe apparent contradiction to known algorithmic results. Uh, in particular, it's known uh, that for three XOR instances on high dimensional expanders, um, uh, constant number of levels of SOS can obtain an arbitrarily good one plus epsilon approximation. And here I'm telling you that uh, uh, three XOR instances, again, on high dimensional expanders that are hard for uh, square root log n levels of SOS. Um, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, both these results are correct. Uh, it's a different definition of on or what it means uh, for an instance to be on a high dimensional expander. And let me just illustrate this a little bit uh, and also to give the construction. So just to do this, think of a hypergraph as a, a as, as, as uh, like we'll think of a simplicial complex, which is just a fancy word for a down uh, for a downward closed hypergraph. So we'll think of collections of three tuples, two tuples, one tuples, and uh, sort of subsets of any three tuple are also contained. And we'll just call them edges, vertices, and um, triangles. And if you think of a three XOR instance with uh, the variables corresponding to the vertices of a triangle and constraints corresponding to triangles. And if you have such a structure sitting on a high dimensional expander, then it's known to be easy uh, if uh, your high dimensional expander is a good one. On the other hand, the instance we construct, uh, a triangle also has three vertices and three edges. So if you think of the, your variables as sitting on the edges of um, each triangle in kind of a three uniform hypergraph, let's say. Uh, and if this is a specific, uh, uh, simplicial complex or uh, expanding hypergraph, in particular the Ramanujan complex by Lubotsky, Samuels, and Vishne, then we can show that the instance is actually hard. Uh, okay. And I won't go into the proof uh, here too much, except to say that in proof complexity, the, such uh, things use kind of expansion of the formula, and here they are replaced by some sort of topological expansion properties of uh, these complexes. In terms of open questions, it's kind of a subtle contrast between these. Uh, vertex or edge variable constructions, uh, it would be good to understand it more. We can stop at square root log n, but it's not clear if that's necessary and other applications would be good to find. Okay. Thank you, uh, So I'll ask the next speaker to start set up and meanwhile, if there is any quick question for uh, Madhu, we have time for that. Uh, 
Salilu has a question. Hi, hey, yeah, Madhur. Um, uh, I, I may be misremembering, but I vaguely recall this sort of distinction between putting the variables on edges versus vertices maybe mm -hmm. came up in, in the context of uh, coding and kind of expander codes versus LDPC codes. If I, Is there any connection there to kind of what's happening in um, what you're doing or just superficial similarity? Um. I mean, okay, I can give a slightly longer speculative answer, so maybe we can talk about it after uh, the session, but... Uh, yeah, uh, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. That sounds like a question that deserves a longer answer. Okay, so for now, thanks, Madhur. And uh, our next speaker uh, will tell us about uh, lower bounds for uh, Turing machines derived from... Uh, multiplayer per repetition. Uh, hello, everyone. So Hi, I'm going Go to be, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. OK, so hi, everyone. I'm going to be talking about block rigidity, multiplayer parallel repetition, and lower bound for Turing machines. This is joint work with Ran Raz at Princeton University. So our main result is the following. We show that. A strong multiplayer parallel repetition theorem will imply the existence of something we call explicit block rigid functions, which will further imply super linear lower bounds for Turing machines with advice. First, I'll start by talking about Turing machines. Turing machines are the standard model of computation used to define complexity classes. Lower bounds for Turing machines have been long known by the time hierarchy theorem. Paul Pepenger's semi and Trotter also showed a separation between non-deterministic and deterministic linear time for multi-tape Turing machines, but no such results are known in the non-uniform setting. The model we are interested in is the following. We'll consider deterministic multi-tape Turing machines that compute multi-output functions. So what I mean by that is that we'll assume that the Turing machines have separate input and output tapes. And at the end of computation, the machine will write the entire output on the output tape and then halt. We'll also allow the machines to be non-uniform. That means that the machines are allowed an advice string, which is a function of only the input length and is written on a separate advice tape at the beginning of computation. Our main result is the following. Let T be any function that is super linear. Then assuming what we call the main conjecture, there exists a function f such that f maps n bit inputs to outputs that are of at most n bits. The function f is computable by deterministic multi tape Turing machines in time t, but the function f is not computable by any multi tape deterministic Turing machine in linear time, and that takes advice. Next, I'll talk about block rigidity and what our main conjecture is. So, in my opinion, the definition of block rigidity is like the main technical contribution of this paper. We'll be considering functions that take n times k bits as inputs and that output n times k bits. We say that such a function is r comma s block rigid if the following holds. So what we want to say that it is not possible to find a large set of inputs x of 0, 1 to the n k over which each output block of the function can be written as a function of a small number of blocks of input variables. So the formal definition is the following. We require that for every subset X of inputs of size at least two to the NK minus R. And suppose we define subsets S1 to SK of one to K. So basically these will index the blocks which will be used to write the output blocks as functions of the input blocks. So we want these subsets to be of size at most S and functions G1 to GK. So the IH bit uh, IF function GI will take as input the blocks of the input that are indexed by SI, and we require that GI outputs the IF block of output of F of X. And we want to say that for any large enough set, this is not possible if F is R comma S rigid. In the case N is equal to one, we'll call such functions R comma S rigid functions and not block rigid. So the word rigid comes from relation to valence notion of 
rigid matrices. More details about this are in the long talk. So I'd say one thing, uh, the notion of rigid matrices was introduced by Valiant to show lower bounds against logarithmic depth and linear size arithmetic circuits. The notion of rigid functions, which corresponds to the case n is equal to one, corresponds. So essentially the same proof gives lower bounds against general Boolean circuits. Uh, for our lower bounds, we'll mostly be interested in the case when k is just slightly super constant and r comma s are omega of nk and omega of k. So this corresponds to very strong block rigidity. The main conjecture is the following. So suppose f, which takes in k bits as input and k bits of output, and which is an omega k comma omega k rigid function. So or more strongly, suppose f is a random function. So random function satisfies such a property with very high probability. Then we conjecture that the function f to the n, which is from 0, 1 to the nk to 0, 1 to the nk, is an omega of nk comma omega of k block rigid function, which is the domain we were interested in. So what is, what is the function f to the n? So basically, the idea is to think of the input as a k cross n matrix, and we just want to apply f to each of the columns, which is of size k, and then the new matrix is the output. I would like to mention the connection between this and multiplayer parallel repetition. If you do not know what multiplayer parallel repetition is, I would recommend you to watch the longer talk. So I'll just state the results here. So we show that a strong parallel repetition theorem for a certain class of multiplayer games implies the main conjecture. Our class of multiplayer games satisfy a very special property, which is the following. For every random string of the verifier, there is a unique correct answer for each of the players. So we refer to such games as independent games. We believe that this strong condition may allow us to prove very strong parallel repetition on such class of games, despite very less known bounds on multiplayer parallel repetition. At the end, I would like to mention some other directions. The first is, can we prove strong block rigidity for other functions? This would imply superlinear lower bounds against Turing machines with advice for those functions. Some candidates are the following. The first is matrix transpose. So given an n cross n matrix A in row major order, we want to output its transpose in row major order. This is basically a problem on permuting the input in a certain form. The second problem is matrix product. So given two n cross n matrices A and B, we want to output the product matrix A times B. Block rigidity for these functions translates to answering very simple combinatorial problems. I would like to mention the problem for matrix transpose here. It basically translates uh, to the following combinatorial question. What is the size of a largest family of n cross n matrices that satisfies the following? What we want is that in this family, for every matrix in this family, the columns of the matrices can be written as a function of a small number of rows of the matrices. So formally, we want to find subsets S1 to Sn of the rows, each of size n over 100. This n over 100 can be replaced by any small constant times n. And functions g1 to gn, which take in these rows indexed by S1 to Sn, and the output, the gth column. So the formal definition is stated here. We conjecture that the size of such a largest family is at most, uh, or the density of such a largest family is at most two to the minus omega of n square. This would imply that the matrix transpose problem cannot be computed by multi-tape deterministic Turing machines that take advice. So I'll end with this open problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kunal. Um, I, is there any quick question for uh, Kunal about his talk? Uh, I might be missing something, but uh, right, so strong parallel repetition does not hold for two-player games. So wh uh, why are you hopeful that it would work for multi? Yeah, so, but the class of games we described, so I said, they satisfy this very special property. So we believe that the class of games that satisfy this very special property, it might be possible to prove strong parallel repetition. And do you know if it works for, for um, two-player games, like for this subclass of games? Okay, so the thing is that if we 
have games that have K players, the kind of bound we want on the n parallel repetition is something like two to the minus k times n, some constant times k times n, and the class we are are uh, looking at it is very easy to prove bounds like two to the minus omega of n. So the question itself becomes interesting when the number of players is also growing with n. Yes, thank you. Thanks again, Kunal. So I'll ask the next speaker to set up for uh, the talk. Sure. Which will be on uh, on uh, C random generators for uh, unbundled with permutation branching problems. Uh, go ahead, William. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, presenting joint work with Ted Pine and Salil Vadan about pseudorandom generators. A pseudorandom generator is a function that stretches a short, truly random seed out to a long pseudorandom string. And the way we make this precise is we consider some class of test functions, f. And the requirement is that um, for every function in this class, if you look at the acceptance probability of f on a pseudorandom input versus the acceptance probability of f on a truly random input, those two acceptance probabilities should be within epsilon of each other. So epsilon is the error of the pseudorandom generator. And the test functions that we're going to be looking at are uh, based on ordered branching programs. So this is a simple model of computation uh, where we have some directed uh, layered graph. Uh, so there are n plus 1 layers of vertices. And each vertex has two outgoing edges pointing at the next layer of vertices. And the two outgoing edges are labeled 0 and 1. Um, a program like this can read an input string as follows. You start at the designated start vertex in the first layer. And then you read the input string from left to right one bit at a time to decide which outgoing edges to take from each vertex. So in this way, you walk through this directed graph and arrive at some vertex in the final layer. There's one vertex in the final layer that's the designated accept vertex of the program. And the program accepts or rejects the input depending on whether it arrives at that accept vertex. So in this way, a program like this uh, computes some Boolean function f on n bits. Um, one of the most important parameters of a branching program like this is the width of the program, which is the number of vertices per layer. Uh, the width measures the space complexity of this computational process. The most important case is width n length n ordered branching programs, when the width is equal to the length. Um, there's a simple argument based on the probabilistic method that shows that there exists a pseudorandom generator for width n, length n ordered branching programs with seed length log n over epsilon. Um, and we would really like to design explicit pseudorandom generators with the same seed length. Um, that would have some uh, nice consequences, one of which would be this derandomization result. It would imply L equals BPL, so the derandomization of space bounded computation. Unfortunately, so far, the best explicit constructions are not as good as the best, you know, as, as, as what the probabilistic method gives. In fact, the best explicit pseudorandom generator for width n, length n ordered branching programs uh, is Nissan pseudorandom generator from 30 years ago, which has seed length like log squared n plus log n times log 1 over epsilon. And so because it's, it's been so long, you know, there have been so many decades without uh, uh, improvements on Nissan's generator for, this, for the general case, um, researchers have looked at more restricted classes of branching programs to try to make progress. Um, one example of, this, of, of a more restricted class is what are called permutation branching programs. So this is where we add this extra assumption that says in each layer, uh, if you look at just the edges labeled zero, they form a matching. And if you look at just the edges labeled one, they also form a matching, or, or in other words, a permutation on the states, a permutation on these states of the branching program. So this, this condition means that we're considering some notion of like reversible computation, like you can, you can recover, you know, you can run the, run the computation backward. Um, and in particular, it implies that the program is regular, meaning that each vertex has two incoming edges. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of research on explicit pseudorandom generators for permutation branching programs and for regular branching programs. Uh, and at this point, uh, we do have explicit pseudorandom generators for constant width permutation branching programs uh, with, a, with a better seed length, seed length log n times log 1 over epsilon. Um, unfortunately, though, for the larger width case, like the most important case, the width n case, uh, 
Uh, prior to our work, the best pseudorandom generator was still Nissan pseudorandom generator, even, even for, the, for permutation branching programs. Uh, so that's where we come in. Uh, we, we were looking at wider permutation branching programs. And we actually said, you know, let's go ahead and skip past uh, polynomial width and let's go all the way to unbounded width. So at this point, you know, when we're talking about unbounded width branching programs, this is no longer about the de-randomization of space bounded computation because we don't have a bound on space anymore. Instead, it's like de-randomization of, of, of some model of reversible computation, this permutation condition. Um, so what we prove, uh, our theorem says that there is an explicit pseudorandom generator for unbounded width permutation branching programs with seed length roughly log n times log one over epsilon. So it's roughly the same seed length that was previously known for the constant width case. Uh, and, and, and here we have this seed length with absolutely no dependence on width whatsoever. Um, the pseudorandom generator itself uh, is not new. It's the INW generator, for those of you who know what that is, impagliato nissan Vigderson generator. Uh, so it's, it's the same construction as ever, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a different analysis. Uh, there is one crucial assumption that I, I really wanna highlight, uh, which is, is, is that in our model of permutation branching program, we only allow a single vertex in the final layer to be the designated accepting vertex. Um, it, it maybe sounds, you know, in some cases that's sort of a technicality, but in this case, it really makes all the difference. And this, this, is, this is a crucial assumption, it's a big caveat. Um, so the only previous result about this sort of strange unconventional model uh, was by Day, who, who, who gave a seed length bound of log squared n plus log n times log one over epsilon. Um, so it's like the same as, you know, Nissan's generator for the polynomial width case, but Day showed it for the unbounded width case. So to prove uh, our theorem, uh, some of the concepts that we use are the concept of the de-randomized square by Rosenman and Vadon. And then this, this recent notion of unit circle approximation, which was introduced at Fox this past year by Ahmadinejad, Kellner, Kellner Murtaugh, Peebles, Sidford, and Vedan. And we really rely very heavily on, uh, on their results and their analysis of this, this unit circle approximation. So for context, uh, let me tell, you know, those of you who maybe don't work on pseudorandom generators, tell you a little bit about how, how these sorts of problems usually go. Um, what we're used to in the pseudorandom generators world is we're used to, you know, we're trying to design pseudorandom generators for some class. And first we can just do a simple probabilistic method argument to show that there exists some pseudorandom generator with, with a great seed length, maybe log n over epsilon. And, and typically it's really easy to prove a matching lower bound, you know, show that that's the optimal seed length. Uh, and so the, the main challenge in the usual case, the main challenge is to devise an explicit construction that matches this probabilistic argument. Um, but this, uh, the model that we're studying, this unbounded width permutation branching program model is, is a bit strange and unconventional. And this whole story provably breaks down. Uh, so let me explain what I mean. Uh, so you could consider uh, sampling some generator uniformly at random from all functions mapping S bits to N bits. And then we prove that unless the seed length is really high, like close to N, uh, with high probability, G fails to be a pseudorandom generator for unbounded width permutation branching programs. Okay, so this is a case where an explicit construction, you know, the INW pseudorandom generator under an, our analysis is much, much, much better than a randomly chosen generator, right? The randomly chosen generator would need near linear seed length. Uh, the proof of this is, is pretty elementary. Um, the main step is just identifying uh, a suitable, like a uh, hard family of functions that can be computed by exponent permutation branching programs. Uh, so because, you know, the, 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 the probabilistic method uh, fails to guide us, it, it, it's not a reliable guide for this model in telling us about pseudorandom generators. Uh, this sort of calls into question, you know, what is the optimal seed length for this, the, for this model? Um, and it turns out uh, uh, we prove that uh, any pseudorandom generator for unbounded width permutation branching programs must have seed length at least roughly log n times log one over epsilon. So this, you know, this lower bound basically matches our upper bound uh, regarding the INW generator. And so it means that in this setting, the setting of unbounded width branching programs, permutation branching programs, the INW generator is near optimal. Um, and so this is, this is strange, it's different than what we're used to. You know, usually for pseudorandom generators problems, what, what we expect is that the optimal seed length should be something plus log one over epsilon. Uh, so, but this is a strange case where the optimal seed length is log n times log one over epsilon. 
Um, so some of the tools we use to prove this are, are some tools from matching theory and some tools from information theory. Okay, so just, just to conclude um, this, you know, we, we studied this unconventional model of, of permutation branching programs with no bound whatsoever on the width of the program. And I think uh, that this model pushes back against uh, some of, of the standard intuitions that we're used to when it comes to pseudorandomness and derandomization. Um, for that reason, uh, I would suggest that it might be useful to have this model and, and these results in the back of your head as, as potentially counterexamples. Uh, you know, to, to any conjectures you might you might start formulating about about pseudorandom generators, um, and uh, there are some open questions. You know, we give several in the paper uh, that are about like extending this work to uh, even more general cases, um, and I, I'd be happy to talk about them. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, so actually, William's talk ran a little bit um, late, so I suggest to skip directly to the next talk. So even if you have short questions for uh, William, hold them uh, until then. Uh, William, please stop uh, sharing the screen so the next uh, speaker can um, uh, share the screen. And uh, uh, next talks will be on uh, notions of uh, pseudo entropy for uh, very limited classes of uh, statistical tests and uh, uh, whether they are uh, equivalent or not. And the speaker, I uh, guess, is going to be Sam. Yeah, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, go ahead, Sam. OK, great. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to share this. Um, my name is Sam, um, and this is uh, based off of joint work with my advisor, Russell. And uh, yeah, so I'll talk about um, so different notions of computational entropy, as well as uh, the dense model theorem. So uh, the starting point uh, for this project is, is a statement called the dense model theorem. And this is a result in pseudorandomness uh, with applications and kind of a surprising uh, diversity of areas. So, so the first uh, application was in uh, additive number theory. And uh, this was due, oh, excuse me, due to uh, Greentown Tau Ziegler. Um, and they were interested in using it to, uh, to you know, solve a number theory problem. They wanted to find uh, arithmetic progressions in the prime numbers. And they used this uh, you know, to prove the Green-Tau theorem, which is uh, you know, kind of a landmark um, of the past uh, 20 years in, in mathematics. Um, another interesting application, which doesn't have anything to do with number theory, uh, is in differential privacy. So uh, Miranov et al., they were able to use uh, the dense model theorem to to give relationships between different computational um, definitions of differential privacy. Okay, so um, so let's work kind of towards uh, towards stating the theorem. So so we basically start with a set S over a finite universe U, and we and we think of the set as being small. Okay, and the and the dense model theorem will give us basically sufficient conditions for S to uh, like look like it's dense according to some class of tests. Okay. And the test class uh, will consist of uh, functions which are kind of, uh, which have bounded range between zero and one. Okay, and like another way of saying looking dense uh, is also saying that maybe S is a high computational entropy. Okay, um, so to be more formal, we're looking specifically for um, an S with, or uh, an S that has such, that has an M uh, so that M is delta dense, so it has measure least delta or the uniform distribution on U. And we also would like it to be uh, indistinguishable from S. So, um, so we'll say it's like an epsilon model with respect to tests F. Um, and this is just the standard notion of indistinguishability. Okay. Um, so the point is, is that M is actually dense. Uh, so we could kind of use uh, nice properties of dense sets. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, to, to reason about us, okay? So, so now we'll talk about the sufficient conditions. So, so the sufficient conditions are actually weaker computational entropy conditions, okay? So, so the, the way we uh, define, or like the conclusion of the dense model theorem says that S has a delta dense epsilon model if it satisfies the sufficient conditions. Um, but there are other kind of reasonable ways to try to, to define uh, what it means to look dense in the first place, okay? 
So in this sense, the dense model theorem will basically give us like an upgrade. Uh, it will kind of take a weaker notion or a set that satisfies a weaker notion of computational entropy and it will uh, tell us, uh, it will give us, um, uh, it will be able to give us a, a stronger notion of computational entropy that us satisfies, okay? So, uh, so basically we're going to have these parameters. We're, so the entropy conditions will be with respect to, uh, to parameters F prime and epsilon prime where F prime is like a new test class based off of F. And we just define it in terms of a function G. So we just take like uh, any K elements of F and uh, compose it with G. And two kind of important examples for us are uh, like a product uh, and the majority of, of K bits, okay? Um, okay, and it turns out basically that there are, there are two weaker notions of, of computational entropy which suffice, uh, you know, to obtain the conclusion. Um, the first, and this is the first one that appeared, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to define it formally, but, but, but uh, it just says that the set S is dense inside of a pseudo-random set, okay? Um, and this was due to Tau Ziegler and, and Gowers also gave uh, another proof of it. Um, and the, uh, the, the parameters in order, uh, in order for this to be true, we need to take epsilon prime to be like exponentially small in the other parameters, but we can take F prime to be like a product of, uh, of functions in F. And so it'll be a product of K functions in F, but I'm going to kind of not really care about K. We can just think of it as like polynomial in like one in epsilon uh, and one in delta, okay? Um, and I'll mention like, so, so it's kind of important that F prime is uh, just a product because, uh, you know, it, it's not clear if they would have been able to establish kind of the pseudo randomness conditions they needed if it was more complicated than that, okay? So the second definition or the second uh, sufficient condition in, uh, which uh, originally appeared in Rheingold, Trevis and Tulsiani have done, um, it, uh, it, is, it, it kind of enjoys a better dependence for epsilon prime. So now epsilon prime can be just some polynomial in epsilon delta, but F prime uh, needs to now be kind of a majority of, uh, of elements in F, okay? And the second condition, uh, I'll just say, um, so, so one name for it is metric pseudoentropy, but you can just understand it to mean that like every F can be fooled by some model which depends on the function. So, so specifically like, um, you know, so I give you an F and you get to design an M which is supposed to be indistinguishable from S uh, with, uh, by F, okay? Um, so we were interested just in understanding, um, you know, if the kind of tension between epsilon prime and F prime is necessary here. So, so like we can see that like if we want to take epsilon prime to be larger, like in the second uh, application, then we need to take F prime to be more complicated. Um, and if we want F prime to be simpler, it seems like we need to take epsilon prime to be smaller. Okay? So uh, we're able to basically show that's true in, in a couple of different, um, um, uh, there, we're able to show that this tension is kind of inherent in a couple of uh, different cases. So kind of informally, we can show that either epsilon prime is going to be tiny or F prime is going to be complicated in some way, okay? So uh, more specifically, like we can show that the dense model theorem will be false uh, in, uh, in AC zero, so constant depth circuits, starting from either of the sufficient conditions if we assume epsilon prime is like polynomial, okay? And we can also show that the sufficient conditions themselves are inequivalent um, with respect to a couple of different uh, test classes like AC0, low degree polynomials, and kind of a more, and there's kind of a more general condition on the test class we can get uh, by using a result of Schulte and Viola. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, so that's basically all I wanted to say about the result. Um, and I'll say a couple of final notes. Um, so first, uh, by kind of a reduction of Impagliat, so these results imply uh, that the hardcore lemma uh, from circuit complexity can also fail. So previously, uh, this was kind of known, like so, so, so Lu Tsai, Lu Tsai and, and Wu showed that like black box proofs of the hardcore lemma uh, can be used in some sense to compute majority. But this is kind of the first explicit example, uh, at least that Russell and I are aware of, um, where the hardcore lemma is actually just false. Okay. 
And then I'll, I'll mention another question which uh, may appear slightly unrelated. Um, but so, um, so this is kind of in the context of de-randomization where we, where we want to uh, construct pseudo-random generators. And an interesting idea uh, for doing that is, uh, which is, uh, which appeared in Sudan, Travis, and Vedan, is to basically generate uh, pseudo entropy in some sense, um, and then extract randomness from them. Okay. Um, so the problem with this is that we would actually need to kind of, we need kind of the strongest notion of pseudo entropy, this idea of having a dense model in order to do the extraction. And, and now we know that kind of doing the conversion from the weaker notion to the stronger notion requires majority. So the question is kind of like, could this framework uh, work in a circuit class below majority? So say for example, like uh, AC zero um, with parity gates, okay? And this is kind of in contrast to Shaltil and Viola who showed kind of another way of constructing pseudo-random generators uh, um, or another kind of step in constructing pseudo-random generators requires majority, which is um, hard and simplification. Um, okay, and, uh, and that's it and, and, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Sam. Um, is there any uh, quick question for Sam? Uh, yeah, Salil, go ahead. Okay, this time I'll actually ask a quick question. Um, yes. Can you just uh, uh, say a little bit more about what you mean with the phrase can fail? You mean you give a function, you give a... Uh, exactly, and a, and yeah. So, so, yeah, we give a distribution which satisfies the, uh, the, the sufficient condition and doesn't satisfy the conclusion, yeah. So it's just false, yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks again, Sam. So stop sharing the screen so the next speaker can uh, set up. And uh, our next talk will be on uh, getting a cubic formula lower bound for uh, an explicit function in uh, AC0. Uh, who is giving the talk? Hi. Hi, yes. So I'm giving the talk. Oh, yeah, Richard. Uh, please go ahead. I didn't see yeah. it. Thank you. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Yuval Filmus and Norma here. Um, right. So we are talking about Boolean functions in this talk and the model of computation is the, the Morgan formulas. So these are binary trees with OR and AND gates and we have variables or the negation at the bottom. And two complexity measures that we care about, about uh, regarding formulas are the size and the depth. So we denote by L of F, the minimal number of leaves in any formula computing the Boolean function F. Note that there may, might be several formulas computing the same function f. And similarly, we denote by depth of f or d of f, the minimal depth of formula computing f. And depth uh, is motivated because it really captures the parallel time, the time that it takes uh, the value, the, um, you know, the, the, this formula to compute uh, the output. If you think of all these things as working in parallel, then the depth is really the, the time it takes values to propagate from leaves to root. And it turns out that studying depth and studying size is essentially the same because of this beautiful connection uh, due to uh, Shapira that showed that uh, the optimal depth up to a constant is log the, the optimal size. Okay, so this brings us to the main uh, open question in this, um, in this uh, field of study, the P versus NC1 question. Um, does every language in P that can be solved in polynomial time can be solved in logarithmic depth, or in other words, in logarithmic parallel time. This is too good to be true. We don't believe this to be the case, but we don't know that this is false. Equivalently, we can ask whether everything in P can be computed by polynomial size formulas. So as I said, there's like a big gap between what we believe and what we can prove. We believe that some problems in P require exponential formula size or linear depth. These are problems that are sort of intuitively are inherently uh, sequential and cannot benefit from running it in parallel. Uh, however, we don't know how to, to prove that. And the best that we can prove is that some problems require n, n cube formula size. And we will see uh, the specific uh, problems that require n cube formula size. And we will see more problems that we uh, show in this work that requires uh, for n cube formula size as well. OK, uh, second. Uh, interesting question that is motivating by the p versus nc1 question is this question about composition. Let's say that we have two functions f and g and we take their composition. 
what do I mean by that? So these are Boolean functions. So to take the composition, I need to take several copies of G. I'm feeding each copy with a distinct uh, set of variables, and then I'm taking all the outputs and feed it into F. So the natural question is, what's the formula size of this composed function? And quite obvious from the picture, the formula size of the composition is at most the formula size of F times the formula size of G. We just take the formula for F and replace every leaf with the formula for G. And the question is whether or not this is type. This was posed in the, this um, semi seminal paper by uh, Karchmer, Raz, and Vigderson. And they conjecture that indeed this is a uh, tight. Moreover, they showed that if this conjecture is correct, then they came up with an explicit function that requires a super polynomial formula size, uh, meaning that they showed how, given this conjecture, you can separate P from NC1. I want to mention that a notable special case of this conjecture is when G is just the parity function. And it is known that this special case is correct. And based on that, we can get the N cube lower bound. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit more about this N cube lower bound. The essential property that is used in this lower bound is the shrinkage of formulas under random restrictions. Let me give you first an example. So here's the formula from the first slide. And now let's fix x1 to be the constant zero. This makes these two leaves a zero and a one. But now we notice that we can actually simplify this formula further because zero and something is zero and one and x3 is x3. So we can simplify it further to this thing and even further to just one leaf. So we see that the formula of size four with four leaves became a formula of size one after a restriction. And this is not a coincidence. It turns out that any formula shrinks under random restriction that fixes most of the variables. And the factor of shrinkage is roughly n squared. So you take any large tree and you fix most of its variables and you get a tree which is of size uh, smaller by a factor of n squared. On the other hand, Andreev came up with an explicit function such that after shrinkage, the formula size sh should be at least n, which means that before shrinkage, the formula sh size should be at least n cube. In other words, in order to show that the tree is large, you show that it shrinks by a significant factor and that it is not that small afterwards. Okay, so Andrev construction is the following um, function. It's actually a special case of a composition. You take a composition of some hard function F0 that is on a few bits, log n many bits. And you take this composition with the parity function over n over log n bits. If you apply random restriction, each of these parties becomes something like a, a dictator and you are left with something like F0. Uh, however, the, the formula size shrinks by factor S of n squared. So this shows you that the formula size of the original function is at least n squared bigger than the size of F0, which gives you the n cube uh, lower bound. In other words, this is also uh, an example that the KRW conjecture holds for, for this special case because the formula size of parity is indeed uh, quadratic. Okay, so I, I proposed one uh, proof technique to show formula low bounds. There's another proof technique. Okay, so this first proof technique that I mentioned is random restriction, and this is a bottom up technique. We sort of saw, saw what happens to the leaves, and somehow from the leaves we went up, right? So, so it seems that like sub formulas became smaller formulas, and we didn't really touch the top part of the formula. There's another approach, which is a top down approach. Uh, using the uh, KW games or Karchmer Wigderson games. This was suggested in this seminal paper of, of uh, Karchmer and Wigderson. They suggested a uh, rephrasing of this question of formula depth in the language of communication complexity. You can write a, a game between Alice and Bob. Alice gets an input x such as fx equals one, and Bob gets a y such as fy equals zero. And the goal is to find a, an coordinate i such that this uh, xi is different than yi. In terms of the protocols for this game correspond, uh, you know, as a one-to-one -one correspondence with formulas for the function. And the size of the protocol tree is the same as the size of the formula. So this is really the same question in a different language. And this is really a top-down approach because you naturally, when you talk about communication, you start with the root and you go down to the leaves. Okay. So it turns out that the top-down approach are very uh, useful in proving lower bounds in the monotone setting. And they also seem to be uh, uh, promising towards the KRW conjecture. 
uh, in particular, in, uh, improving intermediate results towards it. And recently, the Nuren Mayer also gave a new proof uh, using the language of communication complexity for the NQ blower bomb. So it seems that everything that we can do in the bottom up setting, we can also do in the top down. And this motivates the, the question are top down techniques superior to bottom up techniques? This problem that we came up with is can you prove an NQ blur bound not just for any function in P, but for a function that is in AC0, which is like constant depth unbounded Fanini circuits? It seems uh, uh, on one hand that the techniques by De Nour Mayer could be extended to this regime. So we were hopeful to prove it using De Nour Mayer's framework. And we were also certain that random restriction techniques would not be able to prove this result. And the reason uh, for that is that random restrictions have the property that they make any function in AC0 constant with high probability. What does it mean? It means that after the, the restriction, the function is so simple that I can just compute it by a constant, uh, by a, a, simply a constant function or size zero uh, formula. So I cannot really get anything, uh, at least um, superficially, I cannot get anything from random restriction techniques against functions in AC0. Turns out that our intuition was false. And we are able to prove this result using random restriction techniques, but we're not using the standard uh, random restrictions, but rather random restrictions that are tailored to the hard function. Okay, so this is our main result. We've proved n cube lower bound for function in AC0. The function is a variant of the Andrea function. Notice that this is a very similar um, picture to what we saw earlier, but I'm replacing the party function with the surjectivity function. This is necessary since party is not in AC0, so I must replace surjectivity. And surjectivity is a, is a well-studied uh, function that can be computed in AC0 and requires quadratic formula size. We are able to show that this function requires, like this composed function requires cubic size. And in particular, we showed that the Carr W conjecture works when we compose any function F with the surjectivity function. Uh, Avishai, you're quite a bit over time. Okay, so this is just the, the last slide. Can I, can I just finish my last slide? Uh, well, in a few seconds, yes. Okay, so I just want to mention that our proof uses uh, tailor-made random projections um, in a sense that the, the random projections are not uh, independent projections that uh, take everything uh, independently at random, but they maintain the structure of the function that are tailored to the structure of the function. And on the other hand, they also shrink the formula and we maintain, we need to keep a balance between these two properties, which is uh, where most of the analysis goes into. And this is inspired by the work of uh, Rossman, Servetti, and Tan that, that did something similar to separate uh, depth D from depth D plus one. Okay. Yeah, thank so. you, Avishai. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much to all the speakers. Now we have a bit of time, or actually as much time as we want to have follow-up questions. I uh, would like to start with um, Salih's question to uh, Madur about, um, can you remind us what was your uh, question to uh, Madur Salih? Oh, uh, I mean, maybe Madur will rephrase it better than I asked it. Okay. So <laughs> I'll just... <laughs> sure. Uh, Madur, want to, uh, if you remember yeah, Salih's question, can you answer it? Yeah, sorry. So um, if I understood correctly, you were asking uh, uh, this sort of uh, relation between edge and vertex variable version and how it shows in expander codes versus how it shows up uh, in here. So, I mean, okay, the way it kind of shows up in expander codes, if I understood correctly, you're maybe referring to like Tanner codes or something where uh, the vertex is a parity check and edges are variables. So, so there, I mean, one reason to do it is of course that uh, you want dimension arguments, so the number of vertices is less than the number of edges, but if you do it the other way around, uh, it's not clear how to prove things are non-empty. Uh, there is some connection though, in the sense that uh, if you think of uh, triangles, they do form parity checks on, uh, on the set of edges in a high dimensional expander. And uh, uh, the fact that this uh, gives a nice code is something that we do use. Although here, the number of triangles is actually more than the number of edges. Uh, so 
the triangles are always parity checks. It's just whether the variables are on edges or vertices. And the fact that this code is even non-empty is uh, uh, not so obvious. In fact, this is, uh, and this is used in proving the soundness in our construction. It's, and, and, and somehow the fact that uh, you can get these sort of things is the cohomological expansion or co-systolic expansion property of these. Uh, so there is some connection because of this parity check, but uh, it's slightly different, but this is the extent to which I understand it. Great. Uh, thanks, Mother. Uh, thanks, Mother. So actually, I have a question for um, uh, William about the model of permutation branching programs that you work with. So I could see that requiring, so th that you cannot require, you cannot allow arbitrary final states to be accepting because otherwise you could recognize, it. so an arbitrary function would be uh, sort of uh, computable uh, that way. Uh, but what if you, at least allow like a constant number of uh, accepting states, would you get something similar to the known results for uh, constant width permutation branching programs? Sure, yeah, good question. Yeah, so um, if you have a program that has a few accepting states, like let's say A accepting states, then you could write that as a sum of A many programs, each with one accepting state. Um, and so what that means is that our pseudorandom generator does automatically fool programs with several accepting states. It's just that the error uh, grows with the number of accepting vertices. Okay. So a constant number of vertices we can handle fine. Um, but once you get up to like polynomially many accepting vertices, then we're not getting any more, uh, any improvement, you know. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't know what the situation is once you, you know, once, once you have like polynomially many accepting vertices, we, we don't know what the, you know, what the optimal seed length would be. Is there a simple example of a function that cannot be computed by a permutation branching program of unbounded width and uh, one accepting state? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so I guess uh, definitely our pseudorandom generators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, being a possible example. output of your pseudorandom generator. Right, uh, but I that's that's a really good question. I haven't thought about whether there's a simple. There, I'm guessing there's some trivial example, but a uh, good question. I don't know actually. Okay. No, but, but more generally, right? In what's the intuition? What kind of functions can these things compute? I mean, this this kind of branching program. What do they compute? Right. So I think I think some of the intuition uh, is comes from uh, like the the hard example of like hard functions that we used for our, our lower bounds. I think those help to sort of clarify what these things can do. So uh, the the family there is if you consider any permutation on zero one to the n over two. So like any permutation on n over two bits, um, then there is a permutation branching program that takes as input you know x comma y and it tests whether the permutation applied to X equals Y. Um, so that's, that's, that's the sort of thing that you can do with this, like, you know, with this vast amount of width is you can do something like, you know, read and remember the entire first half of the input and then apply some permutation and compare it to the second half of the input. Um, and if the width isn't that large, then this, this model becomes weaker, right? If the if the width isn't very large, yeah, I mean, if the width is like only polynomial, for example, um, then yeah, I mean, then there are pseudorandom, right? The optimal seed length of pseudorandom generators uh, gets shorter, right? If if it's only polynomial width, then we're sort of in this the standard regime where the probabilistic method works and things like that. So, thank you. Any uh, questions for uh, any of the speakers? I have another question for William. Uh, so like the example that you gave as a very small uh, probability of acceptance, do you have, uh, so in particular, it could be approximated by like just constant zero. Do you have mm -hmm. examples where you can show that, you know, that you really, that, that you can solve it with a, a very large width, but you cannot approximate with small width? Uh, good question. No, we have the opposite. We 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 showed actually that there that, that any of these like you know exponential width branching programs can be approximated uh, by a polynomial width branching program, uh, but only on one side. 
Um, we, 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 we get lower approximators, but not upper approximators. And so what that means is that um, if we're considering hitting set generators instead of pseudorandom generators, then uh, the hitting set generator problem for these unbounded width programs is just the same as like the hitting set generator problem for polynomial width programs. And so it's sort of back into the standard regime where the probabilistic method works and stuff like that. Uh, but the approximators only go on one side. So. Do, do we know that INW cannot be a, a pseudorandom generator for a permutation branching program, say for polynomial width, right? But with a general uh, subset of states, uh, right? In like uh, uh, in the end. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, in fact, I would say it seems perfectly plausible that the INW generator does fool those those programs. I mean, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Okay, the next session in the other room is about to start. The first talk will be on uh, total functions in the polynomial hierarchy, and maybe Christos will give the talk, I'm not sure. So if there are no uh, more questions for uh, our speakers, I would uh, thank them once more and uh, close this session. Thanks everybody. Bye, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Ronan, I, if you want to stay on for a second, I think I might have some thoughts on your last question. What, wasn't there wasn't there a paper by Brody or something like, like years ago showing a counterexample for Nissan's uh, generator that there's some instantiation? I, I don't think it was Brody. It was one of Oded's uh, students, maybe a master's thesis that Oded supervised. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, right. No, I don't. I don't remember exactly. But that was yeah. And that was for Nissan's generator, and I don't think it was restricted to permutation programs. I think it's for constant width and not permutation. Yeah. But I, I think maybe for your question. Um, all right, so it, it depends on what do you mean by the INW generator. But if you mean the INW generator, where all you assume of the the auxiliary graphs is that uh, that you have a, a bound on the spectral gap. Okay. Then I then it may be possible to uh, come up with a uh, a bad example. So something along the lines of I think you can kind of cook it up that if your if your spectral gap um, is lambda? Then basically, think of these as like doing random walks on graphs. That it, that that in every step, um, kind of you each time you you do a, a level of i and w or de-randomized square, you slow down the random walk by it. Like with probability lambda, you stay in place instead of walk moving moving forward. Uh, which so there, there, there's some example for the de-randomized square analysis of spectral gap. Being tw being tight in in the de-randomized square paper, um, and, it, and I think it remains tight under kind of recursive applications, which kind of says that um, I think that implies that if you, for example, are using constant degree expanders or constant uh, using constant spectral gap um, in uh, you 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 will kind of mix provably more slowly than than a truly random walk, and hence be statistically far from the right distribution. And so, if you have an arbitrary subset of except for this is just kind of guessing, but I I I think um, the the answer to your question is 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 probably the INW generator. If if this is what you interpret it to be. Uh, probably can't uh, get log in over epsilon. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to get in trouble because I see that Russell is here. So I don't want to interpret the right. I don't want to give the wrong interpretation. But suppose my interpretation, Your interpretation was, is as good as mine. But that's very democratic of you, uh, uh, Russell. I, I also want to right, like the fact that you live in a third world uh, country where people have their uh, coups and they uh, storm the uh, the capital, right? I mean, I'm all there for you. It happened to you someday. <laughs> but, so, but, suppose, but suppose my version of the INW generator was uh, Raz Rangul. 
with extractors, right? and not with spectral. Uh, Yeah, if you start allowing that kind of flexibility, I, I mean, and there's there's some point at which um, there, so the, 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 there's there's some level of generality at which uh, I again, this is just guessing. I think there's some level of generality in the phrasing of the, of the INW generator where if you then choose the graphs that you use at random, one can do maybe some kind of probabilistic method argument to. Um, to argue that it can actually a construction of that form can actually work, um, I think. Uh, I, I, again, I'm not a hundred a hundred percent sure of that. So I think I think it just will be sensitive to how general you allow the course, the construction to be. Yeah. yeah thanks. Do, do you have in mind? I mean, you know, a, a, an approach for proving what you just suggested that you know if we pick the if we if we use random graphs and it's instead of expanders uh, yes 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 that's what i meant by the problem yes exactly exactly random graphs yeah. and you don't you don't go all the way down to the level of um bits maybe um maybe there's some maybe you don't reveal the entire uh uh, uh uh, let's see if I remember correctly. This is a kind of very long time ago, played around a little bit with, with things along these lines. But it's all, it, this is all just kind of guessing answers to your question, Ronan. It's a, it's a, someone, someone should actually try to work it out. Yeah, thanks. It's when... So is, is there any hope to use these uh, techniques uh, uh, for, for like standard, or if, if there is such a thing as like standard uh, permutation branching programs with, with, with fixed width, with like some width larger than a constant? Yes, so, I mean, it did already give, you know, new results for, you know, like the polynomial width case under this assumption of one accepting vertex. No, no. So, but suppose, suppose, I'm, suppose I don't want this uh, this assumption of one accepting vertex, right. and but, but I give you a budget of uh, right. And I, I only I only want you to do more than constant width. So, is, is, are these are these uh, techniques do, do they do they seem helpful? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, if it's like logarithmic width or something, right? Uh, then, I mean, then in particular, there are only logarithmically many accepting vertices, uh, and so you just pay a factor of log n. In the in the error of the program, and so. So uh, maybe it's worth mentioning. So if if we, um, so if you if you take that arbit sort of arbitrary permutation branching programs uh, with any number of except vertices, and you and you don't care about having a generator, but are willing to do a, um, uh, a non-oblivious, um, you know, estimate acceptance probabilities. That that we know how to do. Um, it, it, that was kind of the the previous paper from Fox that that we build on for the generator. That can do that with um, nearly logarithmic uh, in, in in nearly logarithmic sp uh, space. So do what you would be able to do and and even better in terms of epsilon uh, than than you would have with a with an optimal PRG. And so the the a a question is um, uh, an open question though is whether you can get that better handle the many except vertices or get better dependence on the error uh, in an oblivious like PRG uh, like way. Thanks. It's great seeing you guys. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye everyone. Oh, I should introduce Ted. Ted also co author on the paper. Ted, Ronan, Avishai. Ted's hey. an undergrad at Harvard. Hello.
Nice to meet you. I think I, I thank you for all the great comments. Yeah. yeah. It's it's right. I mean, it's uh, twelve uh, thirty, right? In the after midnight in Israel. Uh, it it doesn't look like it behind you. It looks yeah. Uh, sunny. Yeah, sunny and windy. <laughs> where, where is it from? So how is this possible? <laughs> You're not in Israel, I guess. Uh, no, it's virtual. Yeah, I mean, right? It's a virtual background, right? And uh, right, like uh, for, for people who don't know, who don't read Hebrew, I can reveal where Abishai is. <laughs> I used Google Translate already. So. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a challenge anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. Elon was asking me if I'm in a spa. I was, I was answering him. No, I mean, I, right, like I, I could show you the back of the room, but I'm sitting in this like very small, uh, like kind of basement room with a lot of laundry behind me. So I'm trying <laughs> to 